guys. I know, it's weird. Pizza, isn't it? So there must be something interesting about to happen. <laughs> so before I play today's true crime, I want to take a moment to thank My Heritage for sponsoring this video. My Heritage is the number one DNA test kit in Europe that allows you to discover your unique ethnic background. It also matches you with relatives that you may never know that you had, meaning that you have a complete platform to research your family history, which I am obsessed with at the moment because I am literally having my family tree researched right now. Even better, this kit does not just offer you the most in-depth analysis, it also offers you the most affordable, so it really is amazing. I'm actually going to show you how to take the simple test because for those of you out there who think it's complex, it really isn't. Also, if any of you out there are worried that this might be a way of sharing your DNA, it's not the case. My Heritage has committed in its privacy policy to never sell or license genetic data, so you don't need to worry about this at all. Okay, here we go. I am going to show you how easy it is to take this test. So this is how easy it is to do this test. All I have to do is open it and there's an amazing set of instructions that all you need to do is follow. Even better, Pete's going to find out where he comes from too. So we're going to have a little bit of a competition. Like I said, it's really easy to do. All you need to do is follow the instructions and I'm going to show you how to take the swab right now. So basically all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the swab from the wrapper and then all I have to do is I have to rub it in the inside of my cheek for between 30 and 60 seconds, which is what I'm going to do now, but I'm going to speed it up. Then I'm going to take this and all I need to do is take this vial, you just take the vial, open it, and then make sure that you don't touch the swab with anything apart from obviously the material that you've got from your cheek. You pop it in, put it to the bottom, and then all that happens is you break it off. Then secure that vial. It's secure because you're then going to be able to post it. Also, after you've done that vial, you need to do exactly the same with the second swab because there's two swabs here. So then you take that again. Same, get your vial, really, really simple. This is so easy to use. Just make sure that you don't have any contact with the end of that to make sure that it's sanitized. Snap it off, pop it there. So now you've got your two vials. That's a whole history of me. And then all you need to do is you have a sealed envelope here. All you do is you pop the vials onto the kind of tissue that's in there. And they then go in this already self-addressed envelope, so there's no hassle. And you pop it in there. And then in four weeks or so, I'm going to find out who I am, where I come from, and more importantly, who I'm related to. And even better, Pete's going to do exactly the same, aren't you? I sure am. Yeah. <laughs> I sure am. I'm dying to find out where I'm from. <laughs> so me and Pete are going to be able to reveal to you exactly who we are shortly. Keep watching this video because you're going to find out exactly who I am. I'm the, and me. <laughs> now I know that you'll all be desperate to know where your DNA comes from. So as a benefit, because you come to my channel, well, you get a special promo code. If you just pop Emma in the promo box, it means that you'll get free shipping. What's not to like? And let me know where you come from. <laughs> Welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thank you for joining me. If this is new for you and you haven't been on my channel before, I release crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday, religiously. 
my saying is, if you like crime, you like consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. To those of you asking for no comment t-shirts as well, they're released as are hoodies, and there's loads of other things coming like do not comply, which you've asked for. Today's crime that I'm going to cover is one that feels very, very timely, very timely indeed, because I think that we are dealing with a massive miscarriage of justice. I have said this before when I covered the case of Levi Belfield, the serial killer, UK serial killer. And I brought it up in that particular episode that I felt that Belfield was guilty of more crimes and could well be guilty of the crimes I'm gonna talk about today. Crimes that another man will have served over a quarter of a century for. So I wanted to cover this before Michael Stone, the person that I'm going to talk about today, is released. Because at some point he's going to be released. He's served a very long time. He could have actually been released a year ago, but he said he didn't want to because he was never going to accept being considered guilty of this crime. And that's what I'm going to explore with you today. Firstly, because I have a bee in my bonnet about Levi Belfield. I really do for lots of reasons. I think he's killed more people than he's been found guilty of. Whether we'll find out in the long term, the notoriety and level of his serial killing, I don't know. But I'm hoping that what I cover today with you may change your mind about certain thoughts and feelings you have about Michael Stone. It may not. You may fully believe that Michael Stone is guilty for the murders I'm gonna talk about. But I just ask you to listen and also to listen diligently because remember there is one thing that we must always respect in a court of law and that is that the jury must beyond reasonable doubt feel that an individual is guilty of a crime beyond reasonable doubt if there is any reasonable doubt whatsoever then you cannot find somebody guilty so Bear that in mind when I talk to you about this. And this isn't for any way, shape or form to disrespect the poor people who died that I'm gonna talk about today. It's a crime that stays with me because I remember this so, so accurately, so personally because I was shocked when it occurred. I was a young woman and it was mind blowing that I was listening to the information that was being discussed on the news because it was so brutal and there was just something so homely and good about the family that it affected. There was just something really wholesome about the individuals that it stuck with me my entire adulthood. So over a quarter of a century ago, that's when we go back to this crime, the UK was, as I said, completely transfixed and shocked by this horrifically brutal attack on a mother and her two daughters. The attack left two of those individuals dead and another fighting for her life. Also, the family dog was killed. So this was something so heinous, so out of the ordinary, so extraordinarily brutal that it brought the whole of the UK to a halt. It really did, because it was just so difficult to wrap your head around the fact that anybody would want to harm anybody in this way. Essentially, as well, we're looking at children being left for dead. And that in itself, again, stretches the idea of an individual who has such depravity, such a willingness to destroy and destruct human life, that it's hard to even comprehend. It's so outside the realms of what you or I would ever find acceptable. It actually became one of Kent's most notorious crimes. So that was why it was so prolific, because this did not happen in that area. It was so out of the ordinary. So let me take you back to the summer of 2005. The Russell family, the individuals who become victims in this crime, they moved from Wales to Chillenden, Kent, which is between Canterbury and Dover. Actually, it's a lovely, lovely area. It was a family made up of a very intelligent parents, Dr. Sean Russell, Dr. Lynn Russell, and they had two daughters, two absolutely beautiful daughters nine-year-old Josie and six-year-old Megan. When I talk about Josie and Megan, what I see, in fact, the same with their mother, Lynn, I see smiles. If you see any pictures and photographs of this family, they had these great, big, warm smiles, very beautiful. 
And it's that that always sticks with me when I'm talking about cases, in particular in reference to this case, because it's such a juxtaposition to what I'm talking about. This was an amazingly close, loving family. And it's hard to reconcile the reality of what I'm going to be discussing. Sean, who, as I've just said, was a doctor, he was actually lecturing at the University of Kent in Canterbury, so they were very academic. So about 4 p.m. on the 9th of July, 1996, Lynn, who was an academic doctor as well, highly, highly qualified geologist and university lecturer, was walking home with her daughters, Josie and Megan. And the reason for this is the daughter, the youngest one, had been at a swimming gala in Canterbury. So Lynn had then collected them from Goodenstone Primary School. She'd taken the family dog because it was good to exercise the dog and that was clearly what she was doing. The dog was called Lucy, by the way, gorgeous Shih Tzu, Spaniel Cross, and she'd taken that dog to collect the girls and go to the gala and walk home. And just as we would expect, that is a normal thing that a family can happily go and do together without even thinking about the potential ramifications. It's just what we take for granted, isn't it? So they walk back to the home in Nonnington. That should have taken around 45 minutes, but they never made it home. It's as simple as that. About 4.25 p.m., the mother and daughters were walking along Cherry Garden Lane. It's one of those titles, isn't it? Cherry Garden Lane. It just conjures up the swallows and Amazons idea of childhood, everything being pretty and perfect as it should have been. And it was indeed a quiet rural path near Chillingdon. It should have been a place that was safe. Anyway, a car drives past them with a man driving and Josie actually waved at the driver. I'm sure a lot of us have done that, haven't we, when we were kids? Something about waving at a stranger, provoking hopefully a response of a similar wave back. It was something that thrilled us as kids. Certainly I used to do it. And that's what Josie does. She waves at the driver. They then just continue walking. And then they see that the same car has actually stopped and blocked the path. And that must have been scary because even though you wouldn't be thinking that you're in danger, you would be suspicious that it's a little bit strange that somebody's blocked your path and is now getting out. I'm sure those fears would have been confirmed when they saw that the man was holding a hammer. He then approached them and he demanded money. Lynn, who I have to say was incredible, and I will go through that shortly, because I don't think this story is often told with the reality of what Lynn did and the calmness in which she managed this situation. And it's something testament to her coping strategies, really it is. As I said, I'll go into that in a minute. But Lynn basically said that she didn't have any money on her, but that she could get some money from home. Now he refuses at that point. She must have sensed that there was a great deal of danger present for her and her children. So she actually tells nine-year-old Josie to run and get help from a nearby house. Josie, starts running she sets off and i think game that's incredibly brave of josie a lot of people would just be frozen in that moment wouldn't they but she goes he runs after her and he hits her on the head with a hammer but he purposely only causes a slight injury and he does that for a reason doesn't he he wants to let lynn know that there is a potential for serious harm to be for her children. But in this moment, it's almost like a warning. I could have seriously injured your child. Maybe I don't want to injure your children. That's why I've only done it in a slight way. So now you need to do what I've told you to do, because if you don't, well, I may carry out a more heinous plan and harm your kids more direly. So now she's probably thinking, God, as long as he's not going to harm my children, he can kind of do anything to me. And Lynn is certainly a deep protector and her actions demonstrate that. So Josie's dragged back to her and they are all terrified at this point. He then leads them off the path into trees. He rips up Josie's wet towel that she's had from the swimming gala. He blindfolds them with that and he ties them to the trees. Also, he uses the shoelaces and tights that they're wearing to restrain them. All the while, 
Lynn remains calm and she just asks him repeatedly not to hurt her children. Imagine being calm in that situation. Imagine thinking to yourself, I need not provoke this man. I need to not think about my own fear. I need to think about what he has the potential to do and how I can protect my children from him doing that to them. So at this point, calm as she is, the man actually then says that he's going to leave them there and drive away, which is incredibly cruel because I don't think for one minute that's what he wanted to do. I think what he had in his mind was very different. And instead of doing that, instead of driving away, and what really upsets me about that lie is the fact that, can you imagine how Lynn would have felt? She's asked him not to harm her children. He said now he's gonna drive away. So for a moment, he's offered her respite. He's offered her hope. And all the while he knows what he's gonna do. And he just begins to savagely beat Lynn around the head with a hammer. And obviously the kids hear this and hearing them being attacked, you know, Josie is terrified. She's calling out for him to stop. So he repays her for that completely normal response to have a mother stop being hurt by attacking her in exactly the same way. And after he had attacked Josie in that horrible, horrific, heinous way, he did exactly the same to her six-year-old sister. And during that attack, Lucy, their beloved family dog, was also struck with a hammer and killed, which is just unfathomable, isn't it? Later that evening, Lynn's husband, Sean, well, he comes back from work and immediately felt anxious. That's what reports say. He was immediately anxious because his home was empty and that wasn't typical. Now, initially, he tried to reason that there would be a simple explanation and the likelihood was that the dog had escaped and the family were out searching for it. Isn't it interesting how we do that psychologically? We have this fear and dread in the pit of our stomach and it's always quite profound for anybody who's ever been through tragedy, you know. You can kind of know something really horrible has happened and almost expect that you're going to find out something terrible but your brain does a lot of work in trying to prevent you from going there by giving you all these other reasonable suggestions because the idea of coming to terms with something so heinous is just deeply problematic for our psyche but it's like he knows that there is something worrying that's occurred but wants to hope that it's the best case scenario and the dog has just gone missing but as night starts to fall he understandably becomes very frantic because this is completely out of character for his family. Friends then start to help him search for his missing family. They can't find any trace of them. So Sean alerts the police and officers immediately start searching because understandably this is not typical of this family's reactions. This is not their normal behavior. So those police officers soon start searching for the children and Lynn and obviously they go down the route that Lynn's taken. And before long, they stumble across a horrific scene. So it's in a wooded copse just off Cherry Garden Lane. And they discover the battered bodies of Lynn and Megan. They were both dead. So at the scene, they found that there was nothing they could do. Now, the autopsy revealed horrific injuries. Their mother and daughter had suffered absolutely spine-chilling injuries. Lynn had been struck at least 15 times with a hammer. She had a multitude of lacerations to her head. She had nine fractures to her skull. That was including extensive fractures around her left ear, fracture across the top of her skull, extending all the way to her right ear. She had a fracture to the lower back of her skull, fractures to the right temporal bone, massive fractures of the left temporal bone. So that had led to extensive brain damage to the extent with respect that her brain was almost severed at its root. Just think about the gravity of that attack to resort in those catastrophic images. Meanwhile, Megan had suffered similar injuries. So she had a massive compound fractures extended from both sides of her skull. Her head had effectively been split from side to side horizontally and she had been struck at least seven times. This is a little girl. 
Now, somehow, and it is a miracle, Josie had survived. When police found her, her injuries were so severe that on initial glancing, they believed that there was no way she could have survived it. And Sean was actually informed that he'd actually lost his entire family. So the belief was that they'd found the bodies of all of his family. It was only when an officer noticed her move that they found a slight pulse. And she had suffered horrific head injuries. Um, they included an injury to her left ear from which her brain tissue was literally protruding. That was how severe the beating was. She needed major surgery on her skull. A large amount of her brain tissue and splinter bone actually had to be removed. She had a nine square inch area of her skull that had to be replaced with a titanium plate. And that particular area of her brain that was needed for communication was really badly damaged as well. So it took a year before she was even able to start speaking again. So that's how grave the damage was to that poor child. And even 25 years later, she would still sometimes struggle with speaking and with concentration. So this is a family that was left for dead and he definitely intended that all of those people would die in that attack without a doubt. Now, in spite of the fact that Josie did struggle with memory and communication in lots of different areas in the future, after the attack, she was able to actually talk about what had happened and she gave some really good information. So once Josie's condition stabilised, the police obviously quickly spoke to her about the attack. And despite those really life-threatening injuries, she remembered what had happened. And she told the investigators very specific details. She said that they had been attacked by a man with yellow spiky hair who was in his 20s. Said he was tall, like a father, and her father was six foot. Also, she said that he had a large build and she pointed out one of the police officers who was questioning her. It was, she said, it, he's like you. And that officer was around 20 stone. And other witnesses, well, they gave really similar descriptions of what they described as a clean shaven man in the area with podgy cheeks. They also made reference to a car which they described as a beige or butterscotch car really important details and didn't she do well when you think about the catastrophic impacts on her brain and all the things that she went through she was able to remember those really important details now the police obviously want to get the person responsible for this horrific crime because it doesn't take genius to assume that this person is going to kill again you know somebody who has thought they'd killed three people and very comfortably done it and seemingly got away with it, are they not going to do this again? So the police are deeply concerned about the fact that they need to bring this person to justice to apprehend them from causing more damage. So they put it on BBC's Crime Watch. Now, for those of you who don't live in the UK, you might not know what Crime Watch is. It's an iconic show. It's been going since I was a little kid. And basically, they play out reconstructions of crimes to try to jog people's memories. They have brought lots of criminals to justice. And they also do like a most wanted list on their programme. So they put it out on the Crime Watch programme and they show the photo fit of the man that they're looking for. And the case itself actually soon became known as the Chillenden Murders. So that was what it became renowned as. So following this photo fit suspect, basically, a psychiatrist contacts the police. And the psychiatrist contacts the police because they feel that it resembles one of their patients. So this guy who's a psychiatrist has been working with somebody and feels that this individual kind of looks similar. Now the patient in question was 37 year old Michael Stone from Gillingham. So just think about that for a minute. It wasn't that Michael Stone was seen at the crime scene. It wasn't that there was anything linking him specifically to that crime apart from one person who thought there was a potential from a photo fit that Michael Stone could potentially fit it. So let's just have a look at Michael Stone because a lot of people will know him from the pictures that you've seen in the papers. You'll have your assumptions about him as most people would do in cases like this, particularly in motive cases where children 
have one been murdered and one survived, albeit with horrific injuries, and their mother basically executed in front of them. And we're all going to feel a very guttural reaction to that. It's horrific. But you probably don't know a lot about Michael Stone. So I'm going to try to give you a precy of who he is and who he was and what formed him, so to speak. So Stone was born in Tunbridge Wells in 1960. Originally, his name was Michael John Goodburn. He was one of five children and look, he had a really difficult childhood. It was really dysfunctional. He had a lot of abuse in his life as a child. So not a nice experience growing up in that family. His father was a bully and he was very domestically violent to his mother. He was a building labourer and he was very physically abusive to Stone, very physically abusive to Stone's siblings as well. Now, parents eventually split up and his mother seemed to get in and out of relationships quite a lot. She went on to marry a total of four times. So there was this traveling between relationships, as you will imagine, not wanting to sound judgmental towards his mother. You know, we all make choices. I've certainly had a failed marriage. Lots of people marry several times, but it can be quite problematic for children when they're growing up because like it or otherwise, kids do want some consistency. And that really isn't to blame anyone listening to me right now who might have been married three or four times. You know, we all know that ideally in our heads and hearts, we would have liked to have got it right the first time because that would have been better for our kids. But life isn't perfect and we make decisions based on what we need to make at the time. And emotions run deep and love is intoxicating and happiness can feel fleeting. So when you find the opportunity, you take it. But in this case, it meant that Stone had an even more dysfunctional experience than he'd already been born into. And Stone actually ends up in a children's home in East Street near Canterbury. Again, for most kids, being in care is difficult because you've not got your parents and primary caregivers with you and life feels very insecure and sometimes you're exposed to things that aren't really good for you. For example, 75% of kids who go into care, as in the care system, care homes, end up with criminal records. Well, that's not good because it then makes you criminalised and you find it more difficult in life per se. But if it wasn't bad enough that he'd gone through all of this, he then gets abused in his children's home as well. So even the place that's meant to be safe for him isn't safe. So Michael ends up staying in various children's homes and that's from the ages of 10 to 16. Always breaks my heart. It does. I can't imagine a 10 year old being in care. I mean, I can see 10 year olds going into foster placements with amazing care workers who are foster parents and actually provide for them in a way that's like being in a loving home and give them that sense of security. But being in an actual children's care facility, I mean, that's such a cold experience. It really is because it makes you feel abandoned and unwanted. Even when you've got great care workers around you, they go home. You know, when you close that door at night in your bedroom, you are completely by yourself. And it's not surprising, having given you that history, that he grows into a really angry teenager, a really troubled teenager. His police record, as I suggested moments ago, did start early because kids get criminalised when they go into care home systems. And so when he's 12, he's starting to get a police record. And that's a big problem because by the time of 16, he's probably got a rap sheet longer than my arm. And what does that mean for his future? What opportunities is it gonna present for him? How easy will it be for him to get a job, for example? But we've criminalized a young person at this point who's already had so much hardship and dysfunction. The last thing that they need is criminalizing. He gets released from care at 16 and he moves to Gillingham and at this point, things go from bad to worse because not only has he got all this dysfunction, all of this history, all this criminalization, he now forms a dependency habit and he gets a really serious dependency habit. He gets a heroin habit. And I'm sure that anybody listening to this right now understands that when it comes down to drugs, heroin is the piece de resistance as far as being the most dangerous, debilitating, problematic and addiction forming kind of drug that there is out there. So Michael Stone is in a really difficult situation now. He's formed a hundred pound a day drug habit and he's on unemployment benefit. They do not tally. Being on benefits is hard, just buying food. So when you have a drug habit, you are not going to be able to accommodate your needs 
because you're literally not going to have the finances that you require to finance that habit. So he needs to think about other ways of getting money because he was injecting heroin five or six times a day. So that need to finance his habit means that he needs to steal. It's as simple as that. So he's driving around constantly with a kit in his car, which included screwdrivers and hammers because he requires it to get into things to remove equipment from said things. So he would steal lawnmowers, hi-fi equipment, basically anything he would get his hands on. And he was a career criminal. He mainly shoplifted and burgled to make money. But nonetheless, that is how he spent his time. And that criminal early life, well, it continued all the way into adulthood. And in 1981, he gets sentenced to two years for robbery and GBH. He actually attacked a homosexual man with a hammer, which is horrific. 1983, he gets sentenced to four and a half years. Why? Again, really terrible crime. He stabs his friend in the chest with a kitchen knife whilst that friend was sleeping. He actually punctured the lung of that friend and nearly killed him. In 1987, well, he's convicted following an armed robbery. That was on a building society in Brighton. And he got sentenced to eight years. These are really serious offences. So like I've said, I'm not doing this video to try to suggest that Michael Stone is an angel who has literally ended up serving somebody else's sentence and should have been free to go and be the pro-social human being that he really was. The reality is this man was a career criminal. He was doing some really awful things. And it's important that I give you that information because I don't want you to think that I'm dressing this up as a man who like has had his life stolen and was really completely innocent of anything and was always just a really good person. I don't want to paint that picture because it's really imperative that you make and draw your own conclusions from this because it's a moral question. You know, somebody can do really bad things, but just because they do bad things, does that mean that it's okay that they lose a quarter of a century of their life? That's the question I'm asking today. So he gets released in 1993. And I have to say, it's clear at this point, his mental health is really deteriorating. And arguably a large portion of that will be to do with the fact that he has a really severe drug addiction. I mean, anybody who has come across addiction per se knows that firstly, it's fixating for the individual. You know, they desperately want to connect with the thing that alleviates their pain. In this case, we're talking about heroin, but also it means that they don't really have relationships with people around them because the only thing that they're concerned about is achieving their next hit. And if you're not getting that, that's going to be problematic because it's going to cause you a whole heap of physical and psychological and emotional experiences. But when you do get it, that's going to also do that because you're putting foreign bodies in your system that actually cause your mindset to shift and change. So you exacerbate everything on either level, whether you are getting it or whether you're being prevented from getting it. So we see this real decline in this mental health. And he did have a history of what's known as untreatable personality disorders. And he was actually diagnosed at some point with antisocial personality disorder. That means that they're alleging he's a psychopath. So this is not somebody who has been a wonderful addition to our society. But as I wanted to earlier on, draw your attention to the negatives about his upbringing and life. It wasn't easy for Michael Stone. So when this psychiatrist brings in this idea that Michael Stone could potentially be the same person that had been seen on the EFIT on Crime Watch, the police thought, wow, this is it. This has got to be our prime suspect. You know, this is a drug user, constantly needs money to fund his habit, and the attacker had specifically demanded money from Lynn. Also, he had lots of convictions that I've talked about moments ago, which were violent, so several for violence, in fact. And he also had serious mental health issues. When they combined all those together, investigators thought, this looks like a man who actually has the potential to do great damage. And that meant that they felt he was capable of carrying out this horrific attack that had played out. So the 17th of July, 1997, that's more than a year after the attacks on Lynn and her daughters, Michael Stone gets arrested 
and he's interviewed by the police. He stoically and steadfastly denies any involvement, arguably. Most criminals would. You're not going to be like, it was totally me. So I appreciate somebody denying their involvement does not mean that they are innocent of it at all. Believe me, there are a lot of people in prison who say that they're innocent even when they were completely banged to rights in the crime. But the fact is, he does say, had nothing to do with me. He's then asked, okay, well, where were you on the day that these murders occurred? And he said that he couldn't say. He admitted that he'd got no alibi because he didn't know what he was doing that day. He also admitted that he was taking that many drugs that he really didn't know what day it was anyway. Now, for you and me, that actually can be quite an honest response. Because if you asked me what I was doing last year, or even three weeks ago on Wednesday, I wouldn't know. I really wouldn't. I don't remember most things. I kind of remember things that have meaning to me. And the rest is just extraneous noise. But add to that the fact this guy has been taking drugs, it's going to be almost impossible for him to actually dedicate a specific response to say, this is absolutely where I was and what I was doing. But for the police, this is a red rag to the bull. Of course it is, because now he hasn't got an alibi, so he could well have done the murders. And secondly, just because he doesn't remember where he was or what he was doing, doesn't mean that he couldn't have done it if he'd been heavily under the influence. So Stone also, when being questioned, continues to deny any knowledge of the crime but he ends up being remanded in custody whilst an ID parade is arranged, which is good practice because you don't want some psychopathic serial killer on the loose with an opportunity to escape. You don't want to give them that advantage. So they get the ID parade and actually Josie is completely unable to pick him out of that police lineup. Bear in mind, this is a girl who absolutely was able to remember who the person was who harmed her beloved mum. She described him really accurately. Nonetheless, Stone does not get picked out of that lineup. But on the 23rd of September, 1997, this is at a point where Stone actually asks whether he can be removed from the cell that he's in and moved to a segregation unit. And there is a reason for this. He says that prisoners are making up loads of stories about him and saying he's responsible for this heinous crime, the killing of a child as well as a woman. Remember, if you kill a woman or a child, you are considered the lowest of the low. And that means that you can be in line for a whole heap of problems inside. So when you're incarcerated and people find out that you're responsible for what people will consider a crime of cowardice, then you may find yourself in hot water, physically assaulted, nasty things can happen to prisoners. So he's really aware of this and he doesn't want people to have access to him. So he ends up getting placed in segregation, but he is next to a cell of a heroin addict called Damien Daly. Now what Damien Daly says is that that evening, Daly heard Stone confess to him. Literally. Just go with me on this. This is literally what happened. So. Michael Stone, who's been moved to the segregation cell, somehow decides that what he wants to do is to confess to the crime through the gap between a heating pipe and the cell wall. And he decides that Daly is going to serve as some kind of odd priest as he tells them about his sins in the hope that, what, Daly's going to forgive him? Who knows? He doesn't know Daly, but for whatever reason, this is how it plays out. So Daly now has got this information that Stone has admitted that he was, in fact, guilty of killing this poor woman and her child. Bear in mind the fact that Stone actually has been removed from the prison population to segregation because he's afraid that people have found out that he's being accused of this horrible crime, that he doesn't feel that he's in any way related, and yet within minutes of getting to this segregation cell, he's just squealing like a canary. It's as simple as that. But this is what Daly concocts, so to speak, or Daly claims, shall I say. Maybe concocts is a bit judgmental of me, but he claims, right? So he then reports Stone's confession to the police, and it's three days 
after the initial confession occurs. This case ends up proceeding to the trial. Stone throughout pleads not guilty to Lynn and Megan's murders and not guilty to Joseph's attempted murder. Also worth bringing in at this point, police have no forensic evidence whatsoever linking Stone to the crime. Not even one piece. Also, his car had been forensically examined, revealed no blood. Now what they did know, and what they could argue, was that Stone definitely knew the area very, very well. He was often driving through it, basically because he was looking for stuff to nick. So that was why he was driving through it. He knew it very well. He knew your garages, he knew your sheds, he knew places he could get into and rob stuff from. And one of his friends actually stated that he knew Chillenden like the back of his hand. Also, the boot lace, the iconic boot lace that if you look up this case is symbolic within it. It gets found near the murder scene and this boot lace basically bore the hallmarks of the type of boot lace that would be used by a drug addict. And the reason for that is drug addicts will use it as a tourniquet when they are injecting. So it was a 99 centimeter lace and it had three knots tied in it. And the belief was that it was used to strangle Megan. Now people who knew Stone, well they said that they saw him use shoelaces, belts, even a tie as tourniquets because they wanted to bring up the vein, that's what he wanted to do, because he wanted to get a vein that he could inject into. But there was no forensic evidence whatsoever on the lace between the lace and stone. Now bear in mind, if this shoelace is meant to have been used as a tourniquet, there's many things would have been there. First of all, he would have had to fix the tourniquet with his teeth, so when you put it around, you use your teeth to pull it together. And also there would be DNA trace from his skin. So it should have been ripe, literally ripe with DNA. But the authorities decided that the explanation for this was that other drug users had just used it too. And that's why there was no trace of his DNA on there. This is the evidence, guys. What I've just expressed and explained to you is the evidence when it gets to trial at Maidstone Crown Court in October 1998, the main evidence against Stone, aside from that shoelace that I've just talked about, it was testimony from three prison inmates. Three prison inmates where Stone had been on remand. So Barry Thompson, Mark Jennings, who was a convicted murderer, and Damien Daly. All of them claimed that Stone had spoken to them and confessed to the crimes, which is strange, bear in mind the fact that he's not confessed to the police at all, and he's made it very clear that he's not guilty. So this mindset shift that he's now confessing to random criminals, it seems like a little bit of a leap. But the key prosecution witness actually within the whole case was Damien Daly. Now bear in mind what I've told you about Damien Daly, he's a heroin dependent, right? I appreciate when I say heroin dependent that it may trigger people who've had addiction issues who are not liars at all and who've taken heroin and been in trouble with it but been honest, but for the very vast majority of people who take heroin, the heroin is the only thing that they can think about and whatever will get them that hit, they will literally beg, borrow or steal to do so, right? So Damien Daly's history does not suggest that he's the most pro-social, honest human being. In court, he actually admits to being an accomplished liar, so at least he's honest about that. And he claims the reason that he's an accomplished liar is to just get through life. He needs to do that. He needs to lie about things. Now, the prosecution, they stress, well, yeah, this guy's a complete liar, pathological almost. He even owns it himself. But would he need to lie about the confession? I mean, he has nothing to gain. That was the prosecution's defence of this character. Also, Cherie Batts. Now that's a friend of Stone's. 
she gave evidence for the prosecution and what she recalled was that she'd seen him wearing a blood stained t-shirt around the time of the murders again i instantly worry about somebody who suggests that and i'll tell you why because how likely would a murderer be to wear a bloodstained t-shirt around other people it's not something that you would do unless shall we say it had just happened and you bumped into somebody that you knew and you had blood on you but the idea that somebody would be wearing a bloodstained t-shirt around people that they knew would be quite odd because arguably it would be the first thing that you'd get rid of that's the evidence that's it I have just told you the entire evidence and on that evidence they found Stone guilty on all counts. He was given three life sentences. Now don't get me wrong, if Michael Stone was guilty of those offences I would never wish for him to set out a day free in his life. I would want him to rot and die in jail because he absolutely fundamentally deserves it. He deserves a life sentence for what he did to poor Josie and fundamentally, undoubtedly, life sentences for the murder of Lynn and Megan. Simple as. Now, following the trial, obviously Josie and her father need to get on with their lives and they moved to North Wales. This is just a stone's throw from the family home that they'd lived in before moving to Kent. And one of the big reasons for that was they wanted to escape the constant publicity. They wanted somewhere that Josie could safely recuperate. And Josie ultimately became and is an incredibly successful textiles artist, beautiful woman, incredible smile still. In fact, she's recently renovated the very family home of her childhood in Nancal Valley in the North Wales, which is incredible, isn't it? She lives there with her partner, Ewan Sean, and he is a leading horticultural expert at the University of Bangor. So very much following the same family pattern that her own parents had, you know, two incredibly bright individuals, incredibly good at what they do, finding each other and finding love. And I think we all agree that we would want for her to have the most wonderful life, one that she truly and absolutely deserves. However, after the trial, really there wasn't any real form of closure for her and her father because there has been a great deal of controversy surrounding this case and surrounding Stone's conviction because many people believe there's been a huge miscarriage of justice. The suspicion about this basically focused on Stone's alleged confession to Daly, who, as I've said, was a self-confessed liar. However, further doubts were raised when Thompson, one of the inmates who had given evidence against Stone, he came forward and he said, yeah, basically I made it all up. Everything I said in court was a lie. I just wanted the reward money because the Sun newspaper had offered a reward. He said Stone had never confessed to him and actually he'd started to realise that because he'd basically lied to the jury, that the real perpetrator was still at liberty and still free to reoffend and carry out heinous crimes. Gets worse. Sherry Batt's mother, person who said, yeah, saw him, bloodstained t-shirt, absolutely, around the times of the crime. Yeah, her mother came forward and said, I have disowned my daughter. She lied at the trial. She lied about that bloodstained t-shirt. This is what she said. I disowned her because of her lying. If Mick done it, he wants cutting up in little pieces and put down a sewer. All right, he's a psycho, but he didn't kill them. They had no forensics and people lied in the witness box for money. Me and my husband are the only two out of the whole lot who haven't sold our souls. Now in 2001, the Court of Appeal ruled a retrial should take place. Damn straight it should take place, absolutely with this new information coming forward. So they organised a retrial in the following September that year at Nottingham Crown Court. Now despite the mother's allegations, Cherie Batt's testimony regarding the bloodstained t-shirt, it was allowed to be used in evidence against him again. Also, Daly, self-confessed liar, 
Well, he just sticks to his story and says, yeah, actually, it definitely happened. He definitely confessed to me. And therefore, he maintained that Stone had confessed to him. He spoke of the impact, in fact, that Stone's confession had on him the night he heard it. In fact, he claimed that he was so traumatised by what Stone confessed to him that he sat up all night, quote, rocking back and forth on his bed. In fact, he needed to get sleeping tablets from the nurse. Yeah, I bet you did. I bet you needed to get sleeping tablets from the nurse because I bet you fancied a few sleeping tablets, didn't you? Anyway, the judge summed up. The case stands or falls on the alleged confession of Damien Daly. Now, that in itself, I have a big problem with. In the summing up, the judge is saying, okay, guys, this case, it's basically going to be won or lost on the suggested testimony of a man who admits he's a pathological liar, basically. So there is definitely on the judge's side a desire for him to get it across to the jury that it's important that they really think about this. So because of this, the jury actually go to the cells where Stone and Daly had been kept and they tested for themselves if it was possible to communicate through the gap in the wall. So obviously the jury are taking it seriously that there is a possibility that Daly might be lying and wanting to make sure that if they're going to go guilty again, that they have at least tried to see how likely it was communication had occurred, and they'd obviously discovered that it was to some degree possible. However, again, how this didn't get brought out, I have no idea. But all of the details in Daly's statement, all of them, they were widely available to the national press at the time it was made in 1997. There had been extensive reporting across the media. And what's more, Daly was actually reading a copy of the Daily Mirror at the time that he suggested this confession occurred. And that Daily Mirror article had all the reports on the attacks on the day that Stone allegedly confessed to him. So all the information was there. So despite the alleged detailed confession that Stone gave him, remember that's what he said, that it was so detailed that he had to rock back and forth all night. That's how traumatised Daly was. But this was so detailed that you or I could have given exactly the same alleged confession to the police just by reading the information from the papers. He did not give them any more details of the prime at all. It was in the public domain already. During the deliberation, the jury actually asked for the clarification about what details of the crime Daly had access to. They were advised at this point that he only ever had access to read the Daily Mirror. Now, in the Daily Mirror, the article mentioned that the victims had been tied up and beaten with a hammer. But the jury were not advised that actually that wasn't true. Prisoners had access to lots of other publications, including the Daily Mail and the Times. So basically, Daily had access to all of the details of the crime that were in the newspapers. And all he did, as far as one could argue, is combine them all to create the structure of Stone's alleged confession to him. Think about that. Why would it make sense that Stone would make this really detailed confession to him, but he'd only disclose what the press knew? You know, if you want to disclose and you want to confess, you're going to be able to tell that person you're confessing to the hard, stone-cold details of what really played out, not what a reporter has let out to the public based on what they've been told by the police, who will have made assumptions that's what happens. We see things in the press that are assumption-based until the individual actually confesses or CCTV camera footage is played out and so on and so forth. But this guy basically told them what the whole of the UK already knew just by reading papers. It was vague at best. And there was, I will give you, a vague reference also to the shoelace at the crime scene. So he claimed that Stone had mentioned something about shorts or shoes or shoelaces. However, again, mention of a shoelace had been reported previously in the media. So all of this seemed to be a combined amalgamation of what was already out there. 
So on occasions where Daly actually attempted to elaborate on the circumstances regarding Stone's crime, he got details wrong. So he claimed that Stone had told him that the dog made more noise than the victims. Well, it's not true. Josie stated the dog didn't bark. He stated that Stone had mentioned being picked out in an ID parade. Wasn't true. Why would Stone say this? Basically, anyone who had read news coverage could have created a similar statement. Furthermore, the jury had been told Daly had nothing to gain from lying about Stone's confession. This wasn't true at all. The Sun newspaper had offered a reward of £5,000 for information leading to an arrest and a further £10,000 if that arrest led to a conviction. That's 15k of reasons why you lie. Daly had basically claimed that there was no motivation by cash, that it was his conscience that had made him report it. His conscience. It's a bit rich coming from a heroin addicted career criminal and a self confessed liar. Also, there were obvious discrepancies between Joseph's description of the attacker and the way that Stone looked. So that in itself didn't fit. Nevertheless, on the 4th of October 2001, the jury once again find Stone guilty of Lynn and Megan's murders and, of course, of Josie's, the survivor's attempted murder. It didn't manage to reach a unanimous verdict and ultimately they got to a 10-2 verdict. So there were two people who were not happy with that verdict. Now, as the verdict was read out, Stone's own sister, Barbara Stone, cried out, oh no, not again. So clearly the family really struggled with the fact that Michael Stone was convicted of this. And she later stated, every day I wake up and the first thing I think about is he's in a prison cell and I'm walking around. He's confined in prison. But for me, it's a mental confinement. It never goes away. It affects everything I do in life and the way I am. It's a really evocative statement, isn't it? A family member who feels that even though they're free, they're actually in prison too because they feel that their brother has literally been sent down for a murder that they're not guilty of. Now, after the trial, Detective Superintendent Dave Stevens, who led the investigation, expressed a very different opinion to his sister. He said, Stone has the most appalling criminal history and a very disturbed psychiatric history. We were looking for a maniac and Stone is a maniac. I don't think Stone meant to kill them when he started out. I think he meant to rob them, but it escalated and escalated. In interviews, he's never admitted anything, but there were things he said to us that were really disturbing. I have no doubt he was responsible. It doesn't surprise me that that police officer wants to make it clear that he fully believes that Michael Stone is responsible for this crime. You know, this is an individual who would be desperate to bring somebody to justice and would be blinkered potentially by the actual reprehensible criminal record that Stone had and therefore it clouds his judgment potentially. That's just something that I'm posing. But certainly it doesn't sound like he was willing to even consider the fact that Michael Stone may be innocent of this crime we're talking about. So despite this second conviction, does that change Stone's point of view? Does he admit finally that he is the killer? No, he absolutely maintains his innocence. Now in 2004, Stone wins the right to another appeal. Now this is mainly based on issues with Daly's crucial statement about Stone's alleged confession that I've been through. The appeal actually gets rejected by the Court of Appeal. And it states that whilst Daly was a dishonest criminal who would lie when it suited him, this was no reason to view the conviction as unsafe. Despite the fact that Daly's evidence had been crucial in securing the conviction. So, he was somebody who would lie when it suited him, who arguably had stood to benefit £15,000 for saying that Stone had done it. And even though we know all of this, at the end of the day, we shouldn't consider that the conviction is unsafe. I know I'm pushing that point home. The reason I'm doing it, guys, is because if circumstantial evidence and testimony from people who have a vested interest in testifying against somebody for a benefit to themselves 
any of us could be at risk, couldn't we? Any one of us. If a certified liar can stand in court and say that we told them that we did something and we can't remember the day that they're talking about because we were living a different life, we were thinking a different way, we were under the influence of something, but we can't actually give ourselves a certified alibi. And a case can be built around that without any forensic evidence. That makes all of us in a position of insecurity when it comes down to the legal system. And it's very unlikely that in this day and age, we would ever get a conviction on such circumstantial evidence because more and more we've come to rely on bigger evidence such as CCTV and DNA. But arguably, it's really scary when you put yourself in the position of somebody who could potentially be found guilty of something that you didn't do based on very circumstantial evidence, which is what I've highlighted here. On 21st of December 2006, the High Court judge ruled that Stone should spend at least 25 years in prison before they actually considered him for parole. So by then, he'd be 63. 2010, the case gets referred to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. And this is to investigate a possible miscarriage of justice. And it actually rejected his application for an appeal. And the reason that they did that is they stated that they found no new evidence to justify making a referral. So they didn't feel that there was something substantial enough that they could then go to an appeal and say, look, this is different than before. And it's understandable that they have to have that, right? Because otherwise they're replaying the same trial, essentially, that has already been found by a sworn in jury to have a particular verdict. So they need new evidence. And what they do is they request the 99 centimetre lace that's been found originally at the murder scene. However, they're advised it's been lost. They can find the bag it was in, but they can't find said shoelace. We don't know where it is. We don't know. Are you sure you don't know? Because isn't it in a sealed evidence bag? Well, you'd imagine so. But we have the bag, but we don't have the lace. Is that likely that the lace could have just fell out of the bag and nobody noticed it? Maybe a police officer needed a lace. I don't know. I mean, evidence like that should not go missing, should it? Because if it does go missing, at best, it says there's deep incompetence that could create troubling results in things like convictions. And at worst, it could suggest that somebody had tampered with that evidence because they didn't want somebody, shall we say, having an opportunity to challenge that conviction again. 2017, Stone's lawyers claimed that they had evidence that convicted murderer Levi Belfield, the serial killer I talked about at the beginning of this, was the true perpetrator. They'd received information from an inmate who was actually friendly with Belfield. Yes, apparently Levi Belfield has occasional friends, although not friends that keep confidence, it seems. So the suggestion was that Belfield over many months had confessed to this inmate. Interesting as well, that Belfield and Stone were actually incarcerated in Durham's Franklin prison. So they both spent time there. Levi Belfield, let's talk about him. If you haven't seen my video on Levi Belfield, you may as well go and have a watch. I don't have any positive feelings towards that human being at all. He is one of the scariest serial killers that I think anyone could have the misfortune to meet. In any circumstance, whether you're in a relationship with them and you survive, or whether you end up horrifically injured, or in fact murdered. He was responsible for all those kind of things. Now, he actually has a new identity, by the way. He's called Yusef Rahim. He's converted to Islam, which is probably a good thing because at least if he's converted to Islam, there's a potential that he's thinking about what may happen to him when he dies, and also a level of conscience, if it's possible for a psychopath to have any form of conscience at all. Also, bizarrely, he refers to himself in the third person, so he refers to LB. So he's got like this disassociation from the self now. Now, for those of you who don't know who Levi Belfield is, well, he was convicted of killing a 13 year old Millie Dowler in 2002. He was convicted of killing Marsha McDonnell in 2003. 
and Amélie Delagrange in 2004. So he was a horrific serial killer. He's the only criminal in UK history to be serving two full life terms. And with respect, when you look at the Chillendale murders, they fit perfectly, Belfield's modus operandi, because he was known to attack and murder women in remote locations. He would use his car to stalk the victims. His weapon of choice was a hammer. Also, he had a real propensity to attack girls who were in school uniform. And both Megan and Josie had been wearing the primary school uniforms. Belfield was also left-handed and his victims had been attacked from behind. And that meant that the main damage they incurred was to the left side of the head, as in with Lynn, Megan and Josie. Belfield also matched the photo fit and the witness descriptions with respect far more than Stone. So people who had actually seen a person of interest, shall we say, on that day, described somebody who was far more like Levi Belfield. And Belfield was a six foot one man. He was 28 years of age at the time of the attacks. He had a short spiky hairstyle. He had a large build. Also, he bleached his hair regularly and that fitted Joseph's description of the yellow hair. Crucially, the picture that you'll see of Levi Balfour, which I think stands out for us all, is that he had really podgy cheeks. And that had been a feature that lots of witnesses had talked about this guy that they'd seen had podgy cheeks. When you think about Stone's description, however, well, Stone was five foot seven. He was 36 years of age at the time of the attacks. He had a receding hairline and his hair was brown and he was slim. Now that obviously explains why Josie couldn't pick him out of the ID parade because he literally didn't fit the ID that she had given the police. Now, allegedly, Belfield confessed to the other inmate that he had killed Lynn, Russell, and her daughter. And he divulged this information about the attack that wasn't already in the public domain. That is so important to get across. It was the extra pieces of information that meant that this inmate thought, this guy is telling the truth. This guy's confessing to me. Now, his lawyers, Stone's lawyers, also claimed that they had a witness who saw Belfield close to the scene of the murders. Belfield, however, in spite of this confession, basically being drawn out by this inmate who then went and spoke to the lawyers for Stone, Belfield doesn't like the fact that this information has been passed on. So he alleges that Stone was actually trying to bribe him into accepting responsibility for the killings. He claimed that he was sending notes between them in their maximum security cells, that he'd offered him cash because Stone reckoned he was going to make money if he had got cleared by the system and therefore he was willing to cut Levi Belfield in on the cash that he made as long as he took the fall for Stone. Also, he reckoned that he challenged Stone to take a lie detector test. So Belfield certainly wasn't happy that this person that he'd confessed to, apparently and allegedly, had gone and spoken to the lawyers that Stone was being represented by and had concocted or was telling the truth, potentially. I'll let you make your own minds up. And had basically said that this was all to do with Stone wanting to make money and that Stone was the person who was guilty. Around 2019, the commission refused permission for his case to be heard at the appeal court. But it tells you something, doesn't it? Stone isn't letting it go. He's constantly fighting to have his name cleared. And for those of you who still think that Stone definitely did it, as is your right to do so, let me just tell you this, because I think it's important. There was the potential for Stone to be freed last year. That's right. Michael Stone could potentially have walked free from prison last year but he stated that he would refuse such a move until his conviction was quashed until his name was cleared and he previously stated that he would starve himself to death before admitting to those murders again it's very possible to argue that a psychopath who is narcissistic enough to wish to control the world, could arguably be willing to say that they are innocent and 
actually make it so that they have to stay in prison longer to assume that belief system so that the world outside sees him as potentially innocent than to just accept that he really did carry out the heinous crimes. But again, on another level, why would a narcissist potentially do that long term? If you can get out and get on with your life and just get back to living, is it not worth just telling the truth so that you can leave? But no, he doesn't want to. He absolutely wants his name cleared. He wants to walk out of that prison a free man in both the psychological, emotional, social and community form. Now, again, very recently, Michael Stowe's name has hit the headlines for two reasons. Primarily, that missing crime scene bootlace was found last year. Apparently it had been lost for 14 years. We don't know where it is. Well, are you sure it's not that? We don't know where it is. We've got a bag. It's got nothing in the bag. It would have it in the bag if it was there. It's just disappeared. Oh, that's a bit tragic and a bit unfortunate. Yes, we don't know where it is. What's this? Oh, it's the shoelace. So now it's back. It's back. And that shoelace contains traces of DNA, which could confirm once and for all who Lyndon Megan's killer was. Secondly, and it's only this month, and this is, by the way, for those of you who are watching at a different date, it's February 2022, but only this month, Levi Belfield made a dramatic four-page confession to Stone's solicitor, Paul Bacon. That's after more than 25 years and he claimed that he was, in fact, responsible for the Chilindon murders. That confession, well, it provides absolutely harrowing details of how he attacked Lynn and her young daughters. He said this, I was wearing bright yellow marigold washing up gloves and holding a hammer in my right hand. In my car, I had a screwdriver, a lock knife, a hammer, yellow marigold gloves and a very long black boot lace. My first intention was just to attack Lynn, but I quickly changed my mind due to the screams and I was worried that she would fight back given the children were with her. I approached Lynn and held her right arm tight. She asked me not to harm her children. She was calm. Had she screamed, I would have attacked her and left not harming the children. The situation just got out of control and the more she complied, it just gave me more confidence. I walked all three of them down the track. I forced Lynn to sit down. He also describes how he killed the family dog. I grabbed the dog by the collar and it bit my wrist. I hit the dog and killed it. There was blood everywhere, all up my arms, legs and shorts. He also claims that he took a hair scrunchie as a souvenir of the kills. We know that serial killers sometimes like to take mementos. It connects them back to the crime so they can relive it. He went on to state that after the murders, he stopped at the services on the M25 in Surrey. He washed off the blood before driving to his job as a nightclub bouncer. And he said this, on my return, I stopped at Clackett Lane services and cleaned up. I used my t-shirt to clean myself and wipe my shorts. I used bottled water, it was warm and I drove the rest of the journey with no top on. I didn't look out of place. The next day he disposed of the hammer in the Thames near Walton, Surrey. Then he went on a holiday to Turkey, but he returned shortly after. And the reason for that was he was concerned about his beige Ford Sierra, which incidentally guys, does match the color of the vehicle given by the witnesses. And he said that that was full of the victim's DNA. He had blood stains on the seats, so he had it thoroughly cleaned and he ended the statement by apologising to the Russell family and to Stone. He said, something like this has never happened to me in the sense I've committed a crime and another person's been arrested for it. I apologise to Stone and the Russell family for my heinous acts. It's a big confession that also really interesting that he's able to, shall we say, tell us more about what played out that day. It makes you wonder, is it possible that Michael Stone 
has served all those years, more than a quarter of a century in prison for a crime that some other man committed. Now, the Criminal Cases Review Commission is at this point considering whether or not to grant Stone an appeal. So, it's up in the air at the moment. Now, some of you might have listened to this and be still convinced that Michael Stone is guilty. Some of you may be absolutely convinced now that Levi Belfield is, and some of you may be on the fence per se. And it's difficult to know what to make of this whole tragic case because there are clearly concerns regarding Stone's conviction. You know, he may have been a drug-addicted career criminal. He may have been a diagnosed psychopath, but that wouldn't mean that he deserved to serve a quarter of a century in prison for a crime that he didn't even commit, if this is the case. Now, on the face of it, Levi Belfield, as far as I'm concerned, does seem like a prime suspect for the Chillendale murders, especially in view of the confession. But we do have to be cautious as well. And as much as I genuinely feel that there are very serious concerns about Stone's conviction, we do have to approach this with caution because Levi Belfield has had a lot of years to confess to this crime. So why is he choosing now? Because basically Stone is actually shortly due for patrol and he has effectively served the entire sentence that Belfield should have served. So is it a power play? Is it that Levi Belfield is like, hey, I want people to know that I did this crime. Like he's never going anywhere. Belfield is staying inside forever. Does he like the notoriety? Does he want people to know that he is an even bigger serial killer who has an even higher body count, but he didn't want people to know until this other guy had effectively served the entire sentence for him. So he's had the power over Stone, the power over the narrative, the power over the family who've been constantly dealing with the appeals of Stone. And he wanted to have all of that and then say, no, I did it. Knowing that it's made no difference to Michael Stone at all. Could that be the power play that Belfield is using? Certainly, when you think about Levi Belfield's psyche, he is a psychopathic serial killer. He will definitely enjoy knowing that he is the puppeteer, so to speak. Or there is the opposite extreme. He could just be lying. He could just literally be making this up because he wants more notoriety. I mean, he's known to be somebody who likes playing games. He's definitely a narcissist. He likes being in the spotlight. I guess what I hope, and I'm sure that what a lot of you hope listening to me today, is that those DNA advancements, the techniques that they can use on that bootleg, may corroborate Belfield's confession. So if there is some link there to Belfield's DNA, that would be so amazing. Now, if Belfield does turn out to be the true killer, well, the CPS need to take one great big bloody long hard look at itself. Because what they did initially was they built a case around a statement of a career criminal who was a self-confessed liar, and that was their main player in prosecuting. I mean, that is dubious grounds, isn't it? It's like, as soon as Stone was marked as this prime suspect, the police were like, Bank to rights, got him, don't need to look anywhere else. And you see, that is a problem in policing. And like I said, the majority of police officers do an incredible job. The majority of investigations work out for the benefit of the public, without a doubt. But in situations like this, if you have got this bias where you're like, bad rap sheet, criminal history, heroin dependency, known to police officers, has a hammer in the car, this is the guy, then you're not looking anywhere else. And if you're not looking anywhere else, then the possibility is you are abetting and aiding a criminal who can go on to carry out heinous crimes because you're looking in the wrong direction. If Stone is innocent, Belfield was left free and he was left free to destroy so many other lives. Aside from those three young women that he's already convicted of murdering, There was also the attempted murder of 18-year-old Kate Sheedy. He ran over her in his car. And he's also suspected in the murders of five other people. How many could have been prevented? If Stone is innocent, we're not just talking about the miscarriage of justice that played out. We're talking about preventable deaths that should never have happened. I guess the one thing that is certain right now is undoubtedly the victims here. 
over the last 25 years have been Sean and Josie Russell. And while they have shown incredible courage, they have managed to rebuild their lives. And this is whilst having to enjoy multiple trials, multiple appeals, and the case itself, the one that I'm covering today, is because it has constant controversy associated with it. That means that it's highly unlikely that they'll ever be able to have true closure on the brutal losses that they've endured. And because people like me and the publicity and people who are interested and intrigued in this, it's almost impossible to shut the door on that chapter of life. And I know you can't ever shut the door on losing people. When we lose people we love, it's always an indelible connection. But to some degree to know, this is definitely what happened. This is definitely the perpetrator. That's important to know, isn't it? You don't want to imagine that the person who is in prison isn't the person who carried out the crime. And I don't just mean because you don't want somebody who's innocent serving a sentence. It's more that you want to know where your anger where your rage is actually projected. You want to know the person who's responsible because you want to be able to direct that feeling. And even if it's forgiveness that you want to direct, I mean, people do get to that point. People are incredible. Humans are amazing. I've worked with many people who have found the only way to create a sense of peace in their life is to say, I forgive that person. I don't forget what they did. And what they did was heinous, but I forgive them. You know, for some people, they need that. Imagine if they've not even been able to do that to the person that they've been directing all those feelings to because it's not the right person. The confusion that would cause, it's just horrific. Now, hopefully, if Belfield's confession can be corroborated, it might provide them with some peace. It'll also expose uh, absolutely heinous, terrible miscarriage of justice. And finally, it will mean that an innocent man has his name cleared, which without a doubt, is something that I think everybody would wish to happen. You see, that is the dilemma, isn't it, today? Because Michael Stone wasn't a good guy. Before he was sent to prison for those murders, he was a heroin dependent, he was a thief, he was a burglar, he'd been violent. His mental health had certainly been problematic. But that doesn't make him a double murderer. It doesn't make him a mother and a child killer. It doesn't make him somebody who deserves to have over a quarter of a century stolen from his life built on circumstantial evidence. If he really is innocent, then he really is a victim. And isn't it terrible that if that's the case, the thing that really sealed his doom wasn't just the heroin dependent lying cellmate who basically told the police what they wanted to hear and that went to court suggesting that this man had confessed to him, even though we now know that all he did was read back basically what was in the papers. That isn't the biggest miscarriage here. The real miscarriage is the fact that Michael Stone was born to a dysfunctional family, abused, put into care, criminalised through care, and then without foundations and support, fell into dependency, and then began a problematic, non-prosocial life, stealing and burglaring and being violent, all of things that he should never have done, but nonetheless that came from a systemically dreadful life before. So as a child into adulthood, he was somebody whose society failed. And yet it was that very failure that was used against him in court the very bias that the police have described, that Stone was a terrible human being who deserved what was coming to him. You see, if we aren't able to look at a scenario with neutrality, if we aren't able as investigators to be completely careful about the way that our bias affects our beliefs, then these kind of problems will arise again and again and again. I guess the jury's still out on this one, literally because it may be that we do find that the DNA points to the fact that Stone is completely innocent. But what I really want to draw your attention back to is the question I posed at the very beginning of this, which is, in the British legal system, you need to prove a case beyond reasonable doubt that somebody is guilty. If you had been a jury member in the initial Michael Stone trial, would you feel that the prosecution had truly presented a picture 
of a man who was guilty of that crime? Could they really have given you the evidence required to say that beyond reasonable doubt you were absolutely convinced that this human being was responsible for the murders? Or would you at best believe that the information you were provided was circumstantial and at worst it was fabricated at points? And knowing that, would you have been willing to say that this man deserved to go to prison for the period of time that we know he served? Or would you feel that even if you believed he was guilty, even if your bias said that, even if you knew that this guy wasn't the best kind of human being, as a jury member, you still could not in good faith say that you absolutely knew he carried out the killings? It's a question I'm posing for you. I know what I'd have done with the information that was presented at that trial. And I guess we'll see whether in the end, justice plays out differently or justice is confirmed as is the case that Michael Stone was essentially guilty. Time will tell. Thanks for joining me. And as ever, remember, one of the things that I think came out in the case today is that old adage that I say, do not comply, scream, shout, fight, bite, do anything to draw attention to yourself. Because people who are serial killers, the more you comply, the more likely it is that your end and demise will be certain. Take care, look after yourselves, and thanks for joining me on another True Crime. See you again next time. Bye. Okay, before you run off anywhere, remember, I started this video with my heritage DNA, and I'm just about to find out whether I am as English as people probably believe I am, because the suspicion is that it'll just be like 100% English. I am very white. I am very, very pale. What do you reckon you're going to be? Um, mainly sort of English or Scottish. You've got to Celt. have some Celt in you. Celt, definitely. Strawberry blonde and all that. So this is Strawberry it. blonde, I'm blonde. <laughs> strawberry blonde and it's got a reddish complexion so that's very Celtic isn't it right here we go let's find out what I am <laughs> well I appear to be half English at least 50.1% um, English 8.1% <laughs> Irish Scottish and Welsh I thought I'd have had more of that because of my grandfather mm. 41.8% North and West European. What West, does that mean? West European? What does that... 40, 42% nearly. That's a lot. Okay. Where does that mean I'm from? So we're going on the full estimate now. What? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Is that right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Italian! She's 41.8% Italian. I'm 42% Italian! I knew that was why I like pasta so much, and I use it all the time. <laughs> oh my goodness! Is that genuinely that? I'm, I'm, I'm like nearly half Italian. Yeah. Gosh, that makes me so much more exciting because you're a human being. Does that mean I can go around telling people? <laughs> This is my yeah, blowing. West, West, Western Europe, yeah, look. I am Italian as well. Or oh, my DNA is. Yeah. 49. Wow, 42%, 41.8%. Yeah, so North, North, North Italian. Can I tell Western. where I come from in Italy? Is that possible? Let's have a look. That's just showing you parts of Europe. This is insane. Loads of matches with family as well, with people who must be on here that have got Family matches as well. Wow. Anyway, is... what about you? Yeah, let me have a look at me. Let's have a look. Let's log out of yours. I feel really mind blown that I've got 42% of my DNA is Italian. That's really strange. It's opened a whole different side of my expectations regarding who I am and what that means. Yeah. My dad always looked like he was quite foreign and my granddad did as well, but I'm presuming that's DNA because we can go back in England a long way, but it just shows you that it doesn't matter how English you are as far as your family tree is initially. Right. The truth is that 
you could have DNA like mine, which makes you basically mass more interesting. I always, knew you, like, I always knew you like pasta. <laughs> Love pasta. Right, here we go. So it's a stereotype, but it's true. It is one of the best foods in the world. Oh. What are you? What's this? Go so on. I'm trying to find it. Here we go. DNA overview. <laughs> so that's mental. Okay, so I'm 28. 0.1% other S ethnicities, which I'll have a look in a minute. But I'm 25.8% North and West Europe. And I'm 46.1% Irish, Scottish and Welsh. I knew that would be the case. I knew that you'd be... I, I definitely thought that you would be... I have some extended family here as well. But wait a minute. So that out of those other things, you're basically Irish, Scottish and Welsh. Mm. Are you British at all? English at all? Yeah, 21.5% English. 25.8% North and West European, which so is... It's like, uh, so it, it, yeah, top of Ita Italian, no, so it's more, I'm more Germany there. More Germany. And, and Eastern European. That doesn't surprise me. I can see the Eastern European. You're very quick to so, make temper. So yeah, Ukraine, Belarus, you're right, Ukraine. This, this, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, Bosnia. Uh, doesn't uh, surprise me, you're very strong. But look, Eastern European men are very okay. strong. Oh, well, look at this! I'm look at the. So it's showing that I'm mainly from Cork. No in way! Ireland. That doesn't surprise me at all. That means we're going to have loads of American relatives, doesn't it? Because Italian, Italian, and I've got lots of American. I um, bet I have as well. You yeah. can literally see all your family relatives, like first cousins, if you've got them on there, second cousins, third cousins. It's showing Pete has got loads and loads of second cousins, actually. Yeah. Whereas I've got some third and fourth cousins, yeah. I think, there. Yeah, you have, yeah. This is insane. Sorry, I'm, in complete, I'm completely blindsided. So if you want to find out who you are, genetically, DNA-wise, then yeah. go to my heritage. It can break it down literally into regions. It's just unbelievable. We've, both, we've both got... Thousands and thousands, five thousand each of DNA matches in the USA. Do you know, if only that would give me a green card. <laughs> Listen, there's links below, but now obviously I think you should all refer to the fact that I am far more interesting genetically than I first appear when you look at me. Basically, Italian. Just saying. <laughs> when people say to me, when I'm in a car, are you from, like, are you, are you, you're not English, are you? Because I get that quite a lot in London. You're not English, are you? A lot of pe people think I'm Eastern European or Greek. And now I'll just be like, no, I'm not. I'm not really. Like, my whole DNA basically is half Italian. So, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought she was Italian. Liar. <laughs> anyway, get the links below if you want to do your own ancestry. It's amazing. My heritage is absolutely incredible. And it's just given us a whole new world of hobbies where we're going to be contacting lots of our relatives and hoping that we might get some free trips to America. Just saying if you hear from us soon. <laughs> so now you know that I'm basically Italian, guys. If you want to find out where you come from, use my heritage and pop in the promo code Emma and you'll get free shipping. What's not to like? And let me know where on earth is your DNA from? No!